Hello and welcome to Lesson 5 of Denominational Doctrines. Thus far, what we have tried to do is show you some of the problems you're going to run into as you try to love men and teach them out of religious error. We have shown you that some will say, well, who made you the judge? You can't judge. We have shown you that other people will do various and sundry things such as say, well, you can't do anything to be saved. We've tried to show you some of the pitfalls and tried to help you by giving you some Bible answers. Today we're going to do somewhat the same thing. Because when you go into one's home and you study with them the Word of God, oftentimes what you run into is a matter of what shall be our standard or authority. For instance, if you're studying with a Mormon, he'll want to be able to use his writings. If you're studying with a Catholic, they might want to talk about something the Pope has said. Or if you're talking with a Jehovah's Witness again, they want to use some of their writings. And so today, what we want to do is study some false doctrines on authority. We want to look at some of these and show you that many people have come up with false standards by which you and I cannot live. So let's think about the Pope for just a moment as we think about false doctrines on authority. In Matthew 16, beginning with verse number 18, the Bible says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What the Roman Catholic Church tries to say there is that Jesus promised to build his church upon Pope Peter. You know, an interesting thing is I have discussed this with Catholics. You know, I often ask them since they believe in ex cathedra statements, which simply means statements from the chair, or the authority of the Pope, what was the first ex cathedra statement? I also asked him, when did Peter first become the Pope? Was it when Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church? Of course they misunderstand, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus by no means is trying to build the church upon some man, but upon the confession that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that sure foundation, all you got to do to see that's true is go to 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11 where the Bible teaches clearly that Jesus Christ is the foundation. Not Peter, not Paul, not you, not me. But now for a few moments I want to share with you some thoughts on some reasons why Peter could not have been the first pope. And I've got some good reasons that I want to share with you. By the way, in this material that I want to share with you, i got additional material that will be in your notes that I will not share with you at this time. I'll make something, a statement, something about what the Catholics believe. But I have that documented in my notes, but will not read that at this time. Now notice, Peter could not have been the first pope because, number one, he was married. Today they tell us the pope can't get married. But if one looks at the Bible in Matthew 8, 14, 1 Corinthians 9, 5, 1 Peter 5, 1, and Titus 1, 6, we know that Simon Peter was married. Remember Jesus Christ in Matthew 8, 14, healed his mother-in-law. Well, a mother-in-law is kind of something that comes along with the marriage. When you get married, you got a mother-in-law. So Jesus Christ goes into that home and he heals Peter's mother-in-law. But we're told by the Catholics today that the Pope cannot be married. Peter was a Pope, according, I mean, uh, uh, let me rephrase that. Peter was an elder, according to the Bible. 1 Peter 5, 1. But you can't be an elder without meeting certain qualifications. One of which, you got to have a believing wife. Another, believing children. So then we know that this will not meet their criteria for being a pope. Not only that, we know Peter was not a pope because he would not have allowed others to bow down before him. You remember in the case of Cornelius, 
when Peter went there to teach him the truth in Acts 10, 25, 26. Here Cornelius falls at his feet, and Peter takes him by the hand, tells him, get up, for I myself am also a man. He realized who he was. But in the case of the Pope, you see over and over, people bowing to the Pope, even kissing his feet. Simon Peter would not allow that. So we know from the teachings of the Bible that Peter would not allow what the Pope today does allow. Then I want you to notice that Peter was a poor man, but not the Pope, not the Vatican. In Acts 3, verse number 6, the man at the gate called Beautiful, Peter said this, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and walk. Now notice, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but I will give you what I have. And he had the ability to take that poor lame man by the hand and raise him up. And he leaped and he walked by the power of God Almighty. Then I want you to notice that he was a humble man. Of course, when you read Matthew chapter 23, beginning with verse number 9 and following, one is not to take on certain titles. And Peter, when he writes, he simply states things like he's an apostle. 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Same way with 1 Peter 5.3. Notice, he does not give himself some kind of flattering title, but he realizes who he is. Then I want you to notice that he did not consider himself infallible. We have those who try to teach the Pope is infallible. Now that's an interesting little concept. In my discussion with Vin Lewis from New York, when I discussed this on live radio, and he's a Catholic, I would catch the Pope teaching something that was wrong. When I caught the Pope teaching something that was wrong, then Ben would say, well, now he wasn't speaking ex cathedra. Now, if the Pope said something Ben liked, then that was all right. See, they got a unique little way of getting out of the jam they, they're in, but they still can't get out of the jam. When you look at the Word of God, you'll see that in Galatians 2, beginning with verse number 11 and following, that the Apostle Paul rebuked the Pope, quotation mark, Simon Peter, to his face. Because the Bible says he was to be blamed. Now here you got another apostle rebuking the Pope. If Peter indeed was the Pope, but we know that he was not the Pope because of what the Word of God teaches. Then I want you to notice he did not teach that he was the head of the church. Not at all. As a matter of fact, he spoke of a chief shepherd that would appear. He realized that Jesus Christ was the head of the church, 1 Peter 5, 4. Then I want you to notice that other apostles did not regard him as their superior. As a matter of fact, Paul says he's not a whit behind any of them, 2 Corinthians eleven five. So Paul didn't think for a moment that somehow Peter was the superior apostle or the pope. And I want you to notice also there is no biblical evidence that he was ever in Rome. When one reads Romans 16, beginning with verse number 3 and going through the rest of the chapter, basically, Paul is saying as he writes to the church at Rome, tell so-and-so hello, tell this person hello, tell this person hello, and not one time does he say, tell the Pope? I said, hello. You know why? Because the Pope wasn't there. There was not a Pope in the first century because in the first century, Jesus Christ was the head of the church. Well, if it's good enough then, it ought to be good enough now. Also, Peter baptized those old enough to be baptized according to Acts 2, verse number 38. Now, the Pope and other priests, they'll sprinkle little babies. But on the day of Pentecost, here you got Peter doing the preaching. And these people cry out, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter says in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What are you saying, Peter? 
Peter is telling people to repent and to be baptized. Who? Those that are old enough to repent and those who are old enough to be baptized for the remission of sin. So, Peter would not baptize little babies, sprinkle little babies, as the Pope and priest would do today. You know what's amazing? The Apostle Paul would have made a better selection for their Pope, even though he won't work either. But I want to just go down through here and just mention a few things. I have verses here. I'll just mention the verses. I will trust that you will read these verses in the privacy of your own study. Notice, Paul labored more abundantly than them all. 1 Corinthians 15.10 Well, it looks like the Pope would do that. Why didn't Pope Peter do it? Because Peter wasn't the Pope. Number two, Paul was not a whit behind the chiefest apostle. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number 5. Paul says, I'm second to none. Then I want you to notice that Paul had the care of all the churches according to 2 Corinthians 11, 28. Isn't it amazing that Paul says, I've got the care of all the churches upon my shoulders. Well, where in the world was the Pope? Where was Peter during all this time? Well, Peter was caring for other churches. He is working just as hard as Paul. He just wasn't the Pope. And then I want you to notice that Paul was chosen to be a witness to all men, according to Acts 22, 14, and 15. Why couldn't the Pope do that? Well, see, there was no Pope. These apostles were working together. Then the Bible says that Paul was to open the eyes of the people, Acts 26, 16, and following. You'd think the Pope would want to open the eyes of the people. Why couldn't they look to Rome, to the Vatican, and see what Pope Peter wanted them to do? Because Peter was not the Pope. All the apostles were working in conjunction, one with another. Paul was in Rome at one time. Acts 23.11. See, they can't get Peter in Rome, but we know Paul was there. Then I want you to notice that Paul was single. Now, Peter was married. When you read uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 5, we see the both concepts. Paul affirming that he's single, in essence, and has a right to a wife like Cephas, and that's Simon Peter. Then I want you to notice that Paul wrote most of the New Testament. You know, when you pick up the, a New Testament, and if you just read the salutations, You'll see the Apostle Paul's name over and over and over and over again. Well, where is Pope Peter? Lo and behold, all the way toward the end of the book. My friends, if he's truly the Pope, you'd think his writings would be right up here at the front. But you see, Peter had no more authority than any of the other inspired men. And then I want you to notice that it was Paul who rebuked Peter in Galatians 2, 11. You'd think Peter would rebuke Paul. No, Paul rebuked Peter. Then I want you to notice that Paul was the man who had workers with him and under him, Acts 24 and other verses. He was a man that went on missionary journeys. He took people with him that worked with him. Where was the Pope? You see... In the book of Acts, the first few chapters, Peter doing various things. But what happens after Paul comes on the scene? See, when Paul comes on the scene in the book of Acts, Peter is mentioned very little. Well, what happened to the Pope? He wasn't the Pope. And when problems arose within churches, Paul was the one who was writing to them and telling them, what they needed to do in order to be right in the sight of God. And, of course, various epistles address these problems. Just take, for instance, 1 Corinthians. Paul writing to the church at Corinth, telling them what they needed to do about problems like eating meats, taking brethren to law, marriage, and various and other sundry problems. Why didn't Pope Peter take care of all that? My friends, he was not the Pope. Now, Here's the point. We say this in love. And if you happen to be a Catholic watching, 
We want you to know something. We love you. We're not trying to offend you. But we're telling you that there is a greater authority, the Bible, for the Pope is not the authority. The Pope has no authority, no more than what I've got. And so then what we've got to do is turn to the Word of God and read it and believe what the Bible says. Well, another false standard, of course, are creeds. We have people today who want to go by creeds. But this is a false doctrine relative to authority. I've had people want to study with me and bring their creed books. I said, well, you can bring them and you can read them, but they're not going to carry any weight with me because if you cannot establish it from the Word of God, then I'm not going to believe it. Let me point out some things about creeds. You know, human creeds cannot be defending defended rather. The following is a quotation from the words of Benjamin Franklin. First, any creed containing more than the Bible is objectionable because it does contain more than the Bible. Secondly, any creed containing less than the Bible is objectionable because it does contain less than the Bible. And then thirdly, any creed differing from the Bible is objectionable because it does differ from the Bible. Then fourthly, any creed precisely like the Bible is useless because we have the Bible. Now friends, this covers the whole ground. There can be no other thought of. A creed must contain more than the Bible, less than the Bible, differ from it, or be precisely like it. And so then the bottom line is, why do you need a creed book? Now, let me show you the point again. Here's a man who's got a creed book. And I tell him, well, that's, that left something out that the Bible affirms. Well, that won't work. Well, somebody else has got one that's got more in it than what the Bible affirms. So that won't work. Ah, but a fellow says, Wesley, my creed book is exactly like the Bible. Well, then we don't need it because we have the Bible. So creed books are useless. And by the way, look at all the creed books that have been written and how they vary one from another. Friends, we need a standard. That's what this lesson today is all about. We need a standard. That standard is not the Pope. That standard cannot be creed books. The only standard that you and I can endorse is the inspired, inerrant, perfect will of God. Now let me show you what Deuteronomy 4.2 says. It says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I have commanded you. Did you get that? I hope you picked up on that. Don't add to the word of God. Don't diminish aught from it. Why? That ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God. Watch the point. When I add to the commandment of God, it's no longer His commandment. It's mine. When I take something out of one of His commandments, it's no longer His commandment. It's mine. Here the Bible says, Do not add to, do not diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God. In Proverbs 30 and verse number 6, the Bible says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. If I add to the words of God, then God's going to reprove me, and I'm going to wind up the liar. Now, if I tell you, look, all you got to do to be saved is come to the mourner's bench. That's not in God's word. And so, sure enough, come judgment day, guess who the liar is? And even the liar, as I tell you that, is right here. You see, I can't change God's word. In Galatians 1, beginning with verse number 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him which called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now notice the point. Even if an angel comes down from heaven and declares something to you or to me that's not found in this book, 
The Bible says, let that angel be accursed. Can you not see, my friends, that God is serious? He's saying, leave my book alone. Don't add to it. Don't take from it. How serious is he? Let me show you how serious he is. In Revelation 22, beginning with verse number 18, notice what the word of God says. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now notice, if you add to or take from this book, or if I add to or take from this book, our part will be taken out of the Lamb's book of life. What part do I have there? The only part I've got there is that my name's recorded. And so then if I choose to try to change change God's word, then my name is taken out of the book of life. Why, Lord? Because, Wesley, you don't have the authority to do that. That's why. But not only that, I want you to notice he says that our part will be taken out of the holy city. Well, what part do I have in the holy city? Well, that I got a mansion prepared there, that I got a place reserved for me, this is the concept. And when I try to order God's will, I lose all these wonderful blessings. Friends, we're trying to say you on the right authority. It's not the Pope. It's not creed books. You and I, we cannot add to or take from the Word of God. We must speak where the Bible speaks. Remain silent where the Bible is silent. We must do Bible things, Bible ways, and call Bible things by Bible names. Then a third false standard when it comes to authority are parents. Now, I want you to love your mother and father. I want you to respect them highly. But you and I can follow our mother and father only as far as they're willing to follow the Lord. Notice what Paul says. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So we can only follow our parents to the degree that they're willing to follow the Lord. I've had people with tears in their eyes say, Wesley, if what you're saying is right, then my mother and father were wrong. You can say that, friends, in every nation. What about good, honest Hindus? Their mothers and fathers have gone to eternity. Shall they not ponder these truths simply because mom and dad has passed on? What about my forefathers and yours? And all of those who've gone before us, shall we say, well, they probably didn't know this truth, whatever it is, and I don't want to stand against them. No, your mother and father is not the standard. The word of God is the standard. Now, which group of parents are we going to go by? Here are honest parents over here who are Baptist. Honest parents here, they're Jehovah's Witnesses. Over here are some honest parents and they're Mormons. Over here are some honest parents, and they're Lutheran. Which group we're going to go by? You see the dilemma we're in? We've got to have a standard. And that standard, of course, is the Word of God. The Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You know what the concept there is? Children, obey your parents as long as they don't teach you that which is contrary to the Word of God or ask you to go against the teachings of the Word of God. So even God recognizes that glorious principle. And then in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Did you catch it? We're not to think of men above that which is written. I'm not to think of my mother and father above that which is written. I love my mother and father, but they're not my standard. The Bible is my standard. If mom and dad are shown to be wrong, will you stand against them? 
Now there's a sobering thought. What if mom and dad are shown to be wrong with the word of God? Are you going to stay with them? Or are you going to stand with Jesus? Listen to this verse. Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. The Lord is saying that you and I must love our mother and father, our husbands, our wives, our children, even ourselves, less than what we love him. He is to come first. We've got to understand this principle. Then in Matthew 10, 37, He that loveth mother or father more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So notice then, to be worthy in the sight of God means that we put God first. We cannot put mom and dad first. We cannot put our husbands, our wives, our children first. God comes first. So notice then, the Pope cannot be our standard. Creeds cannot be our standard. Even our parents cannot be our standard. Well, you say, what if my parents are members of the church? And they've taught me that, which is right. You know what God would say to you? I don't want you to be a member of the Lord's church because mom and dad were members of the church. I want you to study and learn the truth, and I want you to obey out of conviction, not just obey because that's what mom and dad happened to be, but do it out of conviction. Well, next, and this is a serious point here, your conscience cannot be your guide. We have those who believe that the conscience can be the guide. You know, I have people who call in on radio and say, you know, Wesley, I believe as long as you love God and you don't violate your conscience, you'll be all right. I said, well, what about doing what the Bible says on this? Well, it doesn't matter about that. Just don't go against your conscience. Well, we agree you can't go against your conscience, but your conscience must be educated. Now, whose conscience shall be the guide? Suppose you feel one thing's right and I feel something else is right. We're going to go by your conscience or mine. You see the dilemma we're in? We don't have a standard. Now watch, I want to show you some things here that are very important. The conscience must be educated. Proverbs 22.6 Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Why train up a child in the way he should go if he's already got built into his conscience all the rules, regulations, and guidelines. See, he doesn't have that. The conscience is a prider, as we'll see in a moment. What you and I have got to do is make sure that we educate the conscience so they prod us correctly at the right time. Notice then the conscience can honestly misguide us if uneducated. We have a Bible example of that. Here you got Saul of Tarsus. Saul is arresting and putting to death Children of God, Christians. But I want you to notice his comment in Acts 23, verse number 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. I want you to notice he had lived in all good conscience. But I want you to notice he is wrong. At one time he is wrong when he put to death children of God. When he held the clothing for those who stoned Stephen, he is wrong. Sincere, yes, but he was wrong. Then I want you to notice that the conscience acts on what it believes to be right or wrong. We see this in Romans 14. And you got some people that believe that eating meats would be wrong. It'd violate their conscience. Well, Paul teaches the principle, be gentle with them, teach them, and get them to see the truth. You see, their conscience had not been educated. They did not know the truth on that subject. Then I want you to notice that the conscience is a prodder and not the body of truth itself. Now let me illustrate that this way. I know stealing is wrong. Now a dog, let's say my dog, can come to your house, steal your boots off of your back porch, Never feel guilty about it. 
But I can go to your home, steal your boots, and I feel guilty. Why? Because my conscience start to prod me and bother me. Why do you have a verse that would teach that? Yes. In Romans 2, verse number 15, which show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. Notice your conscience will either accuse you or excuse you. It will either approve or disapprove of what you've done. Now, let me make the point. Here's a very sincere member of some denomination. He does not know that denominationalism is sinful. He goes, he worships with them, he obeys their plan of salvation. Does his conscience bother him about that? Not at all. He believes he's doing that which is right. That's why you and I in love and kindness need to try to get more truth before him so that hopefully his conscience will start to bother him. Maybe he might say to self, maybe I'm not in the right place doing the right thing. And so that's why it's very important that the conscience be educated. Then notice our conscience cannot be our guide because we're to obey God and not men. Now, if everybody's going to go by their conscience, then every man is a law unto himself. We'd have no absolute standard. Here's a guy that feels it's okay to drink alcoholic beverages. It doesn't really bother him. Here's another guy who says, no, we can't do that. Here's a fellow over here that doesn't think it's all that bad to cheat. And someone else says, well, it is. Well, notice what the Bible says. In Acts 5.29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And friends, the only way you can know how to obey God is listen to God. And that means you study this book to find out what God's view is. God, what's your view toward, let's say, abortion? What's your view toward homosexuality? What's your view toward lying? What's your view toward denominationalism? Well, the only way we can know is go to the Bible. Then notice our conscience cannot be our guide because we're saved by faith, and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Anything I do that's pleasing to God must be done by faith. Hebrews 11.6 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. If it's right that faith is produced by this book, and it is, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, then my faith has got to come from this source, not from my conscience. Now, as I work on my faith, and I learn more and more knowledge from God's word, then certainly my conscience will prod me more as I attempt to do those things which are wrong. Then notice, we're set free by truth and not our conscience. That's why our conscience can't be our guide. When one thinks about John eight thirty two, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See, what you got to have is the truth and your conscience working together. Not just your conscience out here by themselves. So then notice... Our conscience cannot be our guide because if that were true, then truth would be subjective and everyone who is honest would be right in the sight of God no matter what he believes. See, if my conscience alone is my guide, whatever I choose to do that does not bother me would be okay. But we know that cannot be the case because the Bible teaches clearly that we are to develop faith through the process of hearing God's word. Then I want you to notice that our conscience cannot be our guide because we are to bring every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. Every thought I got, everything that I attempt to do should be governed by the authority of God's word. How do I treat you? That's got to be governed by the word of God. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. 
casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now that's what we're talking about, friends. We're talking about not just controlling the outward man. We're talking about working on the inward man. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So that's why the conscience by themselves cannot be your guide nor mine. Our conscience cannot be our guide because sin is a violation of God's law, whether it violates our conscience or not. Think about that. Here's somebody, he's so hardened, he can go out and blow somebody's brains out. It doesn't bother him. Well, it's still a sin. Yeah, but it didn't violate his conscience. It makes no difference. See, truth is that which is outside of man. It's objective. And regardless of what I think about it, it's going to continue to be the truth. In 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So I want you to notice then that sin is the transgression of the law, not of one's conscience by themselves. Notice then, number 12, our conscience cannot be our guide because every man would become a law unto himself. Jeremiah 10, 23, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Friends, I do not have the know-how. I do not have the knowledge to direct my steps separate and apart from the Word of God. I just don't have that. But then neither do you. Well, then what are we going to do? We're going to have to have a standard. Can't be the Pope. Can't be Mom and Dad. It's got to be the Word of God. Can't even be the conscience. As great as the conscience is, the conscience, it's a great thing. But it by itself cannot be the standard. We've got to have an objective standard, that being the Word of God. By the way, our conscience cannot be our guide because there would be no standard for a final judgment. But the Bible teaches God's Word will judge us. John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. Notice we're going to be judged by the Word of God. If that's the case, folks, we got to know it. I appreciate you being with me during this study. And may God help you and me to always go by the right standard. And may God bless you as you continue your study.